All right, I think I will get us uh, started with the preliminaries. So um, good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Fernandez. I am the chair of the American Affairs Committee. And it is my pleasure um, to welcome you to this panel, uh, which uh, Diego Duran de la Vega, a partner at Hughes Hubbard uh, based in Washington, DC and co-chair of the Latin American Dispute Practice Group will be moderating uh, and I will um, very uh, shortly turn it over to him. But um, before doing so, just a word of thanks to our co-sponsoring committee, the Compliance Committee. Uh, this, this event is being recorded and uh, we will uh, eventually decide whether to, uh, to publish it. So uh, thanks to everybody for, for joining. Diego, turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this primer on cybersecurity challenges in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and the US. Uh, it, it's such a pleasure to be here. And thanks to Michael for inviting me and uh, for the kind introduction. Thanks to the New York City Bar Association and its uh, Inter-American Affairs and Compliance Committees for sponsoring it. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction on the subject matter of the panel, and then I'll introduce our, uh, the, the, the great set of speakers that we have for, for this session. Um, this session could not be more timely and needed. Risks uh, increase every day on this subject. We saw an important increase during the pandemic on the number of attacks and its sophistication as well. And, and so everyone needs to have basic understanding of cybersecurity these days because this problem affects us all. No one, no one, is, no one escapes, no one is exempt. Uh, hacker organizations target from households to companies of all sizes and governments. According to Harvard Business Review, the amount of companies paid, uh, the, amount of, the, the amount of companies that paid uh, money to hackers grew 300% in 2020. Uh, according to one estimate, ransomware will cost the global economy approximately 20 billion uh, US dollars in 2021. So this is a 57 fold increase from 2015. So as you can see, the numbers don't lie, uh, something's happening. And so we all need to pay close attention. And that's why we're setting up this, this, this session and we're structuring three uh, large sections. Number one, we'll start with uh, understanding what threats are out there. Number two, we're gonna talk about the legal and regulatory framework. And then we're gonna end with a discussion about prevention and response to attacks in private and public sector. Uh, so um, I'm gonna quickly uh, introduce the, the, the panelists. I'm gonna start with Melanie Weedy. Uh, she's an executive specialist at the Executive Risk Claims Department of insurance company Crom and Forster. She handles all types of cyber risk and claims. She pre uh, previously, she was data breach counsel and has led hundreds of firms through the notification process. She has a BA in government from Georgetown, a master's in philosophy from University of St. Andrews and a JD from University of California, uh, Hastings College of Law. Then uh, and the, another speaker is Vitelio Ruiz. He's uh, the general director of private sector investigations and verification at the Instituto Nacional de Transparencia, Acceso a la Información y Protección de Datos Personales, INAI which is the Mexican government institution in charge of protecting transparency, access to information and personal data. Uh, he has a law degree from Univ Universidad Panamericana in Mexico. Then uh, we have Paulo Lila from Brazil. He's a partner at Lefosa Advogados, law firm in Brazil. Uh, he focuses on technology and data protection. He has a law degree from Fundación uh, Armando Alvarez Pentel. Uh, a master's in international law from Universidad de Sao Paulo, a PhD in international law from Universidad de Sao Paulo. He's a visiting scholar. He was a visiting scholar in 2012 at Stanford University Law School, and he has other diplomas and certifications related to cybersecurity. Uh, from Argentina, we have Diego Fernandez. He's a partner at Marval O'Farrell y Mayral. He's a member of the firm's IP, IT, and privacy groups. He focuses, among other things, in cybersecurity. He has a law degree at the Pontificia Universidad Católica in Argentina, master's in IP at the uh, Facultad Latinoamericana de Ciencias Sociales, master's in information and tech and privacy law at the John Marshall Law School. And he's a professor at, at, at the Privacy and Data Protection Executive Education Program of Universidad Torcuato de Tela. And he's a board member, uh, co-chair of the Program Committee for the Americas and chair of the Latin American Committee of the International Technology Law Association, ITEC Law. 
So um, without further ado, uh, let's, let's just get started. Uh, so what, why don't we talk about threats? Uh, I, I'm sure everyone here uh, it, it would very much like to, to, to hear about you, the experts. What are the threats that companies and governments are facing right now? Why don't we start with you, Melanie, please? It's nice to meet you, Anna. Thank you for joining us. You know, really, uh, I think everything, but if it, you have to distill down to one thing, I'd say it's resource taxation. Um, you know, when you talk about cybersecurity events, I think that, you know, ransomware, phishing, and employee errors still are at the top of the list. But with COVID and the onslaught of like sort of unexpected remote working and all of these workforces um, moving to online um, and companies having to make these hasty decisions using employee devices or even their own devices, but not having the infrastructure to make sure that the security patches are up to date, you are seeing ransomware proliferate um, throughout um, the world. Um, we're seeing, you know, the, the two or 20 million or $20 billion paid in ransom for this year is not surprising to me. Um, we routinely see now ransomware events um, that include exfiltration of data that have demands in the tens of millions of dollars. Or just a few years ago, that would be a sort of shocking um, incident. And today it's everywhere. I think we've all heard about Colonial Pipeline where they're now attacking um, the infrastructure of you know, governments and entities. So we're feeling it in sort of every face and facet of our lives. Vitelio, why don't you tell us from the, uh, since you're the only one on this panel from, from a government agency, uh, why don't you tell us what, what's your perspective about what, what are the threats that governments are facing nowadays in terms of cybersecurity? Well, at least in Mexico, I think it's pretty much the same as the private sector. We were not prepared for uh, changing from a in presence uh, attending to work every day to go to our houses and start working just from there. So different things happen, but uh, at the top of my mind is ransomware and employee error that has been uh, the most uh, significant uh, cyber threats that we have been uh, seeing right now and it has to do with obviously the lack of infrastructure the lack of uh, politics for the employees to follow in the government and uh, that people is using their own devices pretty much or some office devices but without proper measures in their houses uh, to work so that's uh, what we have been seeing to first and training and uh, i think that the trend if we continue with this is going to scale up Okay, yeah, one of the questions I have for you is about, about trends, but before that, I mean, we cannot deny that we're experiencing historical uh, levels of cyber attacks. And, and, I, and I turn to, to you, Vitelli, again, to, to give us some, some color as to why. why. Why now? Why are we seeing such an increase in cyber attacks? I think it obviously has to do that we have uh, turned pretty much our world, our meetings and, uh, our, and the education of our kids to, uh, to the cyberspace. And obviously this uh, puts pressure on the, the measures that we should put. We typically in our homes, we don't even mind or we don't even put uh, that attention on what actually is happening in our servers, in our computers, in our routers. And obviously uh, this has something to do with that. The second part I think is that there is a lack of conscience of the people uh, regarding cybersecurity and some uh, basic measures that you have to take into account because you think that your information is not valuable. But since we all are here on cyberspace right now, it turns out that maybe it's valuable for someone. And this is what is actually making that uh, hackers and uh, people that is actually committing crimes is starting to, to focalize on uh, regular people just making their regular things and not uh, the big companies because everybody now it's in their houses and the information of the, the houses we want it or not in some way passes through our routers, our computers. And that's pretty much uh, the sense of what's happening right now. And uh, it won't change at least we have uh, basic education information on what cybersecurity should be and some measurements from the companies that uh, would help people to uh, make uh, better decisions on their security and their devices. Okay, and, and now I'll turn it to you, Diego. Uh, so 
I mean, a lot of people say that, you know, the pandemic created some sort of a perfect storm for uh, cyber attacks to increase. What, what do you have to say about that? Um, first, uh, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> nice to be with all of you. So uh, what I see, Diego, is it's, it's a kind of a mix of what Vitelio and Melanie were saying. Um, the pandemic was a, a perfect time. Um, I, I'm, I'm talking, you know, my experience is in Argentina, but I probably I'm representing the whole Latin American region. If I say that uh, most of the companies, most of the private sector was not prepared to go 100% online home. Um, there were few companies, many, many, you know, it might be the tech companies or other companies who were more in line with that. Um, I would say that there were not many, you know, laptops uh, for employees that it could be the case in the U.S. So the region was not like that. We, we still had desktops all the time. And so we have to go after that and, and, and give everybody a, a computer to go home and be 100% online. So as Vitelio was saying, that meant that many were connecting with their own devices, which were not prepared. Uh, the IT infrastructure that we have at home is not the same that you would have at the company. Not even in the companies, you might have all the perfect, you know, IT infrastructure. Imagine going home with that, and um, and and I see, uh, of course, during the pandemic, it was a growth, uh, a very high growth in, in ransomware attacks. That's what we see in Argentina, and I've seen in some of the neighbor countries. And there was something that Vitelio was saying that ring. I think it was very important the other day I was discussing with someone very close to me um, and, and he said that one of his passwords and email was compromised in, in an attack. It was a service that he given, you know, he didn't give to that service any importance. And I said, it's not, you know, that, that service might not be important, but I, I tried to think with him, do you use that same password for any other services? Do you use that email address with that password for other services? Yes, I use that. What, what for? For the bank. Say, okay, so so your password is now, you know, someone has your password. The, the first thing they will do with your email is try to use your password and your email with any services around the globe and see if they fit any of them and then get to some other services that are really important to you. So I, I, what I'm trying to say is, uh, there's a lot about education that we haven't started to talk about, but um, normally people would not be very savvy of how these work. I, I've have, I've seen, you know, in our office, we, we from time to time have these tests that we send out emails that are impersonating, but just from our, you know, our own IT guys. And we see clicks in, in places in which you wouldn't imagine someone would just think that that is something real, you know, and, and we can get in many examples, but that's what I see uh, during the pandemic. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I would assume everyone here has been to some extent the victim of, of a cyber attack. I, I know I have been. And I know that uh, from, from some short time uh, until now, I, I personally see more things coming from even more different uh, avenues, right? I think uh, I started, I, I think I started receiving last year now consistent and, you know, strategically sent SMS with like weird SMS trying to impersonate other services uh, or just like a weird link. There's a lot of people out there. I mean, at least I, I've had the benefit of, of receiving uh, cybersecurity training, you know, uh, as a regular person, all employees in my firm have, have, have had to do that. But there's a lot of people out there who hasn't. And so I, I agree with you in terms of, you know, the, the people need, people, companies and governments need to get more sophisticated and more educated in the subject. So let's get into the into into the question of I mean how bad uh, ransomware attacks have been hitting uh, you know entities and and what 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 do you tell us Paulo what's been happening to Brazilian entities? You're you're on mute, Paulo. I'm so, I'm sorry. Your mute is the most uh, common phrase we we heard during <laughs> the pandemic. Um, but thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's it's a very nice to be here with you guys. Uh, well, uh, ransomware attacks is not not the cyber attacks are not different in Brazil. This trend of increasing, especially ransomware attacks. Uh, ransomware attacks are on the rise in Brazil. Uh, studies show that this type of cyber attack has increased more than ninety percent in Brazil since the beginning of twenty twenty one. This follows. Uh, uh, this global trend that has been uh, mentioned before. According to one of these studies uh, published by Sonic Wall, a company uh, based in Palo Alto, Brazil is the fifth country in the world that suffered the most ransomware attacks the first half of 2021. It's a big market 
as uh, a large company. So it's, it's, it's a target. The main sectors affected here is health, industry, the public sector, finance, logistics, engineering, food and beverage, and retail. Recently, we had a very, uh, last, the, the end of uh, last month, we had a, a very uh, severe restaurant attack with Lojas Henner, which is the largest Brazilian clothing store chain. And it suffered a ransomware attack that forced the company to shut down all of, this, all of its uh, 600 stores, physical stores. It also impacted e-commerce activities and, and payment services. Uh, another uh, that was very severe as well is the Grupo Flori, which is Brazil's largest medical diagnostics company. Now, it also uh, rendered this all systems unavailable. The company uh, uh, had uh, trouble with the systems for days. Uh, so it, very, it was a very severe uh, attack. And the public sector also have been uh, uh, victims of ransomware attacks. The National Treasury, for example, has been hit with a ransomware attack last, last month. Uh, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the year, the Superior Court of uh, uh, Superior Electoral Court also suffered uh, uh, a ransomware attack that rendered the the, the, the entity the, the court uh, two weeks in standstill without being able to 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 operate. So it's very it, it's affecting uh, the companies in Brazil very bad. Interesting. Thank you, Paulo. Melanie, what can you tell tell us about what what's going on in the U.S.? How about things are? Can you give us some examples? I know you, you talked about the colonial pipeline. I think that's a major one, right? It, it, it specifically because you know it, it affected a national critical infrastructure uh, system. What can you tell us? Can you tell us more about that case and maybe others? And you know, give give your perspective about how bad things are in terms of the attacks in the U.S. Sure. Um, you know, in the United States, I think ransomware events have been pretty prevalent for the last six to eight years. Um, they've been around for a while. Obviously, not heating up um, quite as much as they are you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, but they certainly existed. I think the real shift is um, like what constitutes a ransomware event these days. It used to be the case that you would inadvertently you know, get an email and click on a link and then malware would download on your device or you would go to you know, a bad, an employee might go to a bad website and click on something and then the payload would hit, all the files would be encrypted and boom, you have ransomware event or you have ransomware event. So then you're forced to either hopefully have backups and restore, or you would be um, paying um, a, you know, for a decryption key or trying to just reconstruct your network. Um, that is not the common uh, methodology anymore of um, threat actors. They are now becoming much more sophisticated. They're entering your network um, sometimes you know, days, weeks, even months in advance before they drop that malware. They're learning where you keep all of you know, your sensitive information. They're looking up what your insurance policies are and what your bank account numbers are to figure out how much you can pay um, if you, know, you fall prey to the ransomware that they're about to drop. Um, so that in negotiations, when you say, I can't afford a million dollars, they'll say, well, you know, actually, I've seen your... Um, insurance policy, and I know you have a $5 million limit. Um, that's happening. So they're hitting you by knowing your network, stealing your data, exfiltrating it. Then they drop the payload. They hit you up to try to have you pay a ransom. And then um, on the back end, they will steal your data and then sell it on the dark web and make money there or have you pay to keep it quiet. Um, so it's become you know, obviously much more significant. It's not just about trying to restore and having a business interruption claim and getting back up and running. It's about what they're using that data for that it's being stolen and it's harming customers and, and individuals. Um, so Colonial Pipeline is an example where they did do a bunch of reconnaissance. It wasn't just that they got lucky with a particular employee inadvertent clicking on a link. They had gone through the network, they had determined you know, what the critical stand like points were, stolen a bunch of data and information, and then they dropped the payload um, of ransomware to, you know, wreak havoc um, in this instance on a really important, you know, line for gas for the United States. How, how much uh, was paid for that ransom? 
Um, I don't recall exactly. I want to say, I know that it was recovered by the FBI, which is pretty uncommon. It was a great story in the United States, certainly that they were able to recover that dollar amount, um, but it isn't a common event. I can tell you that I've personally handled hundreds of ransomware events, and I think I've seen recovery um, less than five. So, you know, it was, you know, the FBI, the Secret Service, they really, you know, it's an impressive feat, but it's a pretty uncommon event. Um, so I would typically expect when that money leaves the door that you are not seeing it again. Interesting. Would, would you know, do you, is it public? Why, why was this case different in terms of the FBI being able to recover at least some of the money that was paid as ransom? Um, I think that they were, you know, part of the reason why it's so difficult to usually recover is because more often than not, the threat actor isn't within the United States or within, if it's in Brazil, the threat actor isn't in Brazil. And so the jurisdiction for law enforcement typically is localized, right? So, you know, the FBI may not have jurisdiction outside of the United States. And so it usually requires um, global, um, you know, a global work um, coming together and, I think when it came to the colonial pipeline, other countries may have been concerned it could happen to them. And it was a big enough event to capture the world's attention. Um, I think, you know, in smaller events, you know, a lot of these companies, you hear million dollar ransoms, but they aren't necessarily a company you've ever heard about. And so to get that kind of like global cooperation is pretty difficult, particularly because they are so prevalent. I mean, they're happening every day in every state of, you know, the United States, and I'm sure in every county and state, you know, across the world. Understood. So now, I mean, related to that, we, we, we've heard, you know, how, how prevalent these attacks are and how much they're affecting. And, and so, I mean, what is the expectation? Is the expectation about the levels and sophistication of the attacks for the next few years that they're going to keep increasing? Because that's what we've been seeing, right? The, the, the amount of attacks have increased, the, they get more sophisticated. You were explaining, Melanie, now it's not just an in and out job. They could spend weeks or months just analyzing, planning you know, very carefully the attack, where to hit, um, you know, getting information that would actually help them negotiate a larger payment. So what, what's the expectation? And, uh, and I turn to you, Diego, and then, and then Paolo. So I would like to hear what you, what you have to say about that. So I, I kind of share the, what Melanie was saying. Um, I, I do see, I do see um, a lot of sophistication during the, the years. And of course, the expectation is that they will continue to get even more sophisticated. Um, I could say for experience during the last year that we have been helping different flights in Argentina and some other countries. Um, that, that, that what Melanie was saying is actually exactly that. They, they get into, you know, they gain access into your systems, but they are not just showing up in a single moment. And uh, it's not about encrypting the, all the files and asking for ransom. It's more getting in, making some analysis of who the company is, because many many times they just get in and they don't know where they are, and they do their, you know, they do their homework. They see what you do, uh, who do you communicate with, who you're maybe your shareholders are and whether you can have a, because we have seen that from getting into a very small company of a group of companies, they jumped into a very big fish, which was one of the shareholders that they have an intercom system and they could get in from there. So, uh, you know, and I guess this is the same for all of us. We work with, um, with some partners in the forensics and, and then they confirm that what we are seeing is uh, more sophistication um, and that, you know, if I have you know, one, one more minute, uh, Diego, I think I, uh, maybe we will talk about that during the conversation, but it's also about, um, you know, critical infrastructure and a mapping. I, I think that in, in, at least in the region, uh, Argentina going up, up to Mexico, uh, we still need to do more, more homework in, in terms of what is critical for the for each of our countries, uh, which are the sectors, which are the companies. Which, you know, we don't have an, 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 if you do not know where you have the, the, the jewel of the crown, then it's very complicated you know, to put to every asset that you have the same level of, uh, of security. And I think that that's something that we are not doing and, and we have to do in, in the very near future. Right now, we, we, we certainly are behind, all these countries in Latin America are way behind 
in terms of experiencing uh, these attacks. You know, Melanie just explained that the U.S. has been witnessing those and dealing with those for far many years than, than the rest of Latin America. So yeah, there's a lot of sophistication that needs to happen uh, uh, from, you know, in the different countries of Latin America. Paulo, what, what, what do you think about this? No, I totally agree with Diego. Uh, it's, it's exactly the same here in Brazil. Uh, companies are not prepared for that. Although we have, uh, we've been seeing new laws and regulations coming up to, to force companies to get more prepared to increase the level of maturity with regard to, to cybersecurity and data protection. Uh, but uh, there is a long way uh, to go. I think the companies are, uh, we, are we see that uh, the companies you only uh, get increase the budget, budget to invest in, in cybersecurity after being hit by a cyber attack like that. So uh, it's like it, it, the, 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 the problem in my view is the companies are not prepared and Brazil is a big market, big, uh, large companies, uh, a very intense uh, identity theft activity, fraud, banking fraud. So it's a, a market that criminals uh, purchase data on the dark web and deep web in order to uh, commit this kind of crime. So uh, it, it's it's a it's a big market, and uh, uh, companies are not prepared for for this kind of cyber attacks. And uh, certainly, uh, the more companies are, uh, um, are getting digitalized, are engaging in the, in, in technology transformation. Uh, more, they will be more uh, vulnerable to this kind of attacks. And I don't see this changing in the short run. Thank you, Paulo. And, and I wasn't gonna uh, ask you about this, Vitelio, but now I, I think we, we have a very clear picture of you know, what's happening uh, in, 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 in terms of the threats that you know, uh, people are seeing, companies are seeing in Argentina, US, Brazil. Could you quickly tell us more about you know, the kind of, I mean, it, tell us more about those threats in Mexico. How, how bad is it? Is it as bad as everyone, everywhere else? Yes, I, well, I think that we have to differentiate. I think that there is something to do with COVID and uh, it's, it's upscale it and it has to be something and other things has to do with the particulars in Mexico, for an example, I think that one of the huge sectors that has been uh, affected uh, by, a, a, I don't know, a bigger chunk of cyber attacks here in Mexico, it's the financial, the financial sector. Why? Because pretty much all the banking in Mexico is done by electronic means. So we have been seeing people that is getting uh, uh, hacked in the, with their uh, with their uh, passwords and users. So when you actually ask them what happens, they should be victim of phishing or uh, some kind of uh, social engineering. And at the end, uh, that's what actually happens. But we have also known from cases that uh, the bank was actually uh, with the security breach and uh, many people uh, just lost their life savings because uh, the security breach and we have been seeing at least uh, three or four of them this year for sure, uh, at least very nice uh, in I to know and uh, we are investigating right now. So it's been interesting that some sectors are particularly more affected and I think that the financial one is a primary uh, uh, yeah, I think it's the one that is getting more hit right now if you're in Mexico. It's a particularity that I think it's important to tell. And the other thing is obviously due to COVID, uh, the, uh, the, lack of, uh, the lack of experience and everybody working home. And from the government, uh, what we have seen is uh, a number of uh, breaches. And I think that it has to do with the change of the people that is in charge of IT and the change in the government. So uh, what is to our understanding is that uh, at least in government, we have uh, some rules and uh, basic cyber security that we have to implement that is called Matic. But uh, for some reason, uh, the people that is arriving now to the government is not a, as experienced as they should be in Matic. So what is actually happening is that they are getting breaches because they don't have a deep understanding on the implementation of MATIC and what it's supposed to be doing as a policy across the government. Even though that we have a national strategy uh, of cybersecurity, it's still 
uh, a work in progress in the implementation of it. So that's uh, pretty much what we can see right now in Mexico. Okay, thank you. So now, now let's let's switch gears and talk uh, talk about the legal and regulatory framework because I'm interested to hear uh, from all of you. You know, each each briefly, I would like to, for you to summarize what's I mean, what what have different countries. Uh, uh, how have different countries responded to the search in cyber incidents? What, what are the countries doing? So why don't we start with you, Melanie? Well, in the United States, um, I'd say all 50 states have data breach notification laws as of 2018. And many of the states have cybersecurity laws, um, but also federally, the Department of Treasury, and in particular, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, um, is passing regulations and updating those regulations even as of most recently this past week. Um, you know, basically having an update on the list of the specially designated nationals, um, which is essentially a list that the FBI and the Department of Treasury come up with that determine who are threat actors and basically outline the ability to pay um, certain cyber, um, certain criminals and certain criminal networks, as well as even virtual um, uh, Bitcoin exchange, not Bitcoin, um, certain virtual, um, virtual currency exchange networks and platforms. Um, so I believe SUEX was just banned this past week because of over 40% of the transactions on SUEX was determined to be oh, wow. um, criminally related. Um, so it's no longer lawful to pay a ransomware event on that um, platform. Interesting. Okay. What, what about what about Argentina? Yeah. What, what is Argentina uh, doing in terms of uh, trying to to you know counter all, all that's happening? So, um, so I would say that Argentina, as, as, as the rest of the region, I say I, I think we are our process in getting cybersecurity regulations, it's, uh, it's going slow. In our case, uh, we do have a data protection law and, and, and within that data protection law, you can, you can discuss whether notification of data breaches is mandatory or not, but it's related to um, personal data. So if you have a security incident and any data is exfiltrated by its own personal data, then uh, that's a different story. Uh, and even when it's personal data, we, we, you know, our law was one of the first laws enacted in, 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 in Latin America. So it's from 2000 when none of the technologies that we know uh, existed. And so a data breach notification was of course not in the law. And there's certain doubts as to today whether that's mandatory or not. Uh, and when it comes to cybersecurity, I would say that there are certain regulations, most of which are uh, directed to the public sector. We have a, we have a cybersecurity committee, uh, which enacted certain regulations. Actually, they, there's a definition of critical infrastructure. There's a mapping that is uh, intended to be done. We, there's no certainty if we have done that or not. But again, everything, Diego, seems to be more directed to the public sector than to the private sector. And again, if we are not mapping, um, yeah, at critical infrastructures. If we do not define critical infrastructure, for example, as the, I would say the health sector, the finance sector, which is mostly run in many cases by private uh, companies, and we do not have a standard, we not raise the bar uh, to have a very, very, uh, I would say, competent standards there, then um, it's kind of complicated because if, for one side, you do not have a, a mandatory obligation to comply with certain things. And then of course, if you do not have a standard that you're following or at least a minimum standards of security information, it's kind of easy and, 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 and it's the, the, the obvious effect that you will be hit sometime with a cyber attack. So that's what I see in Argentina. We're still in the process of, of uh, getting more regulations. Uh, most of it, them are for the, for the public sector and we have little or nothing in, in the private. Okay. Uh, Pablo, what's what's going on in Brazil? Well, uh, <clears throat> we've been seeing here an increase in laws and regulations being issued and enacted uh, over the past two years, two or three years. We have the uh, Brazilian General Data Protection Law, which is very similar to the GDPR, it was enacted in, back in 2018. 
and it came into effect last year. It, it brings uh, similar notification obligations than uh, the GDPR when a uh, cyber attack uh, involves uh, uh, personal data. Uh, and, but also uh, we've been seeing uh, a lot of, lots of uh, sectorial regulations being issued by regulatory agencies, especially the banking sector, banking and payment sectors, insurance sector. Uh, we see now the Brazilian Securities and Exchange Commission uh, imposing uh, the obligation to notify uh, uh, security incidents that may impair the business, so uh, that may result in, in, in business risks. So uh, publicly traded companies are required to issue, to disclose uh, any incident that may impair the business. To the to, to to investors and prospects, uh, so it, it's been increasing over the the, the past the recent years. Now, for the, the because of the recent cyber attacks in the public sector, uh, in a response to to these ransomware attacks, the federal government has created a cyber attack response network aimed at promoting faster response to cyber threats and vulnerability through coordination between federal government bodies. So it's, it's very uh, uh, something that's uh, it's still in progress. Uh, this, uh, but we know that the, both government and private sectors are worried about that. And so we see more regulation, regulations coming up. Paulo, is, is that uh, cybersecurity network you're talking about only for to respond when there are attacks against the government? Or, yes, or, okay. no, against public uh, federal bodies. On the federal body, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, is is there any other bodies or agencies that uh, would would intervene or not help the public navigate uh, when when there's an attack, like uh, the companies? No, the, uh, no. The the, the 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 laws and regulations currently in place they only requires uh, they only require uh, notifications for to the National Data Protection Authority or to the, the specific regulatory agency like the central bank requires if there is a, a, a cyber attack at the, involving a bank or a financial institution or a payment institution that may uh, jeopardize the financial system uh, in some, some, somehow, then you have the obligation to notify. The same is the Security and Exchange Commission, something that must be disclosed to 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 stock market. So uh, when the, the the cyber attack uh, compromise the business continuity or compromise uh, or entails risks that uh, investors should be aware of. Interesting. Okay, Vitelio, what, what, what's going on in Mexico? They're pretty much uh, the same in Brazil. We have two laws in data protection: one for the public sector, one for the private. In the public sector, they are obliged to uh, notify uh, the people affected, but also the agency, in this case, UNI. In the private sector, it's a 10 year old law, so we are uh, a bit, uh, uh, it has to be updated. So uh, they have to uh, notify the people, but not the agency. So uh, that's for, uh, in case of data protection, there's also mandatory notification for the public trade companies when they, uh, this incident uh, may come to the continuity uh, or affect the uh, business operations. And also we have a national strategy of uh, cybersecurity uh, and uh, the companies, at least in Mexico, uh, all the companies that uh, use data, uh, personal data, are obliged to have uh, security uh, measures and a risk assessment based model so that they can implement enough uh, security measures and that they have a virtual cycle so that they can actually keep uh, upgrading and uh, changing and modification and modificating these uh, measures so that they at least try not to have a cybersecurity incident. This is in, uh, for both uh, private and public sector. 
And uh, we have uh, special regulations, obviously, uh, by sectors like uh, the fintech. They have uh, some special regulations about uh, at least minimum requirements and what uh, international standards they should be applying to their operations. So we're getting there, but yes, we are not as advanced as in the United States, but uh, pretty much what we see in the Latin America area, we're the same. And, and now, is there, is there an agency or an institution that it's tasked with the cybersecurity of the, of the country, of the government at least? Uh, not uh, yes and no. We have the National Guard, and the National Guard has a cyber crime uh, division, and they have this uh, CR, uh, CERT Center for Quick Responses. So they actually uh, try to keep an eye on all the traffic that is going all the way in all Mexico, at least. And it's pretty much uh, almost impossible, but they do it. I think they reach uh, every two weeks, they cover what should be Mexico all, all the way. And uh, they collaborate with private uh, with private response centers also. So it's a network that is not uh, formally appointed, but they work jointly every day and more for the response part than the prevention part. But yes, we have uh, the National Guard in charge of that. And we collaborate as in I with them on a daily basis. I, w I was gonna then ask you about that. I mean, since, since we have you and you, you, you're part of the government, you're part of this uh, uh, very important institution, uh, uh, which protects, as I mentioned, transparency, uh, access to information and data protection and, and, and personal data, I'm sorry. What, what, what role do you guys play? Can you talk a little bit more about what the role you play in terms of, uh, of cybersecurity? Yes, uh, what we actually have is this verification procedure that uh, require that you comply with the law. The law states that you should at least have the same security measures for personal data that you would use commonly for uh, whatever infrastructure or data you are using. And also it uh, puts you a minimum on uh, security measures, thinking on technological, uh, physical and admin administrative measures. That's the model. It's an interesting model, but it's based on uh, the old directive from the European, the European Union that uh, was before the GDPR. And for the public sector, it's pretty much harder because right now what we have is the same verification process, but the law for the private sector states that you have to have a security document with certain characteristics and a minimum basis that should be uh, review by the uh, at least on a daily and on a yearly basis, and uh, I think for the threats is uh, not daily but just weekly basis. So uh, what we actually do is that uh, we verify that they comply with the minimum measures, and obviously because the components every day are taken into account, uh, they're on technological means. It supposes that we have. Uh, an easier understanding on that is cybersecurity. And for that cases, we also have engineers in the Institute and we have our forensics, uh, forensics equipment and uh, our own model of uh, security that we actually try that companies, uh, SMBs implement so that they can comply with the law. So that's what we are in pretty much in cybersecurity. And obviously we work uh, very close with National Guards when we come to uh, the part of felonies and, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the identity theft, uh, child porn, all that stuff. We work daily basis because uh, from some sense, we receive many uh, complaints in these regards. So, so are you the, the natural conduit of those complaints, and then you you uh, channel those to 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 the to the, the a different federal authority who's going to investigate and, and prosecute? Yes, uh, in many cases, when it constitutes a felony, what it should happen, or in many cases happens, is we make our part that it's pretty much a, a law enforcement, but not in the crime sense, but in the administrative part and uh, we then pass all our investigation to the uh, National Guard and then they do that with the uh, 
to the prosecutor and they present a case with our case information. So uh, in many cases, yes, we uh, finish uh, working together. And sometimes, uh, and sometimes it's in the other way. They just know that there's something with data protection related. So they refer us uh, their information and their files paper, and we start investigating from their point. Interesting, thank you. Now, now I'm gonna turn it to you, Diego. So you're gonna, uh, uh, Vitelio mentioned a, a, a minute ago uh, about, he mentioned international standards. Uh, are there any international regulation and, or, and standards and what are they? So there are international standards, but if you mean if they are mandatory in the region, uh, I think they are not. Um, there are many very well known in standards, ISO, and, and, and there are many others, many from the US and many others from the EU. Uh, but um, I know there have been some intents in within certain blocks in the region, like Mercosur, if you know, uh, would, there, there are certain countries that are part of the same economic groups, and they try to get together to have some regulations that would benefit all of them. But we haven't get into a point in which we have like a minimum standard that certain products um, have to comply with. There, of course, there are. If if you try to import uh, TVs or um, a washer into Argentina, you would have to comply with certain requirements in terms of the plugs and uh, and the electricity that they use, etc. But no one, you know, this is something very important. You what you're asking is we need to get into a minimum standard when any any anything that connects to the internet and make it vulnerable, uh, not because of that product itself, but also because they interact with many other infrastructures, there should be some kind of minimum um, um, protocols to comply with. I know, I'm, I'm eager to hear from Melanie, but I know in Europe, there are, um, there are standards, there are standards if, if you are in certain sectors of the of the market, you need to, for example, to uh, to get some uh, products and services that is, are related to infrastructure for IT from certain vendors that are vetted from for different uh, government agencies. And the same applies if you are manufacturing certain products. Uh, again, you need to comply with uh, minimum standards. The same standards that you have seen for certain like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, et cetera, but for many other products. We don't see that. And, and I think that's an opportunity. Um, we need to come to, a, maybe it's an international treaty, maybe, you know, we, we, we can think how, uh, but it's, it is very important that at least we have minimum standards all around the globe. Uh, and if we cannot have it, you know, uh, globally, at least have that for certain countries in the region. Uh, to strengthen security of IT infrastructure. I think that not having that and, and being able to manufacture and sell in the market any product which make it very vulnerable for the product, for the company, for the companies uh, working with that company, uh, it's, uh, it's a pity that we don't have a, a common ground there. Um, happy to see that coming. And, uh, I, and I think I've seen conversations, Argentina, with Brazil uh, and some other countries from Mercosur trying to get into a minimum standard, but I haven't seen that uh, happening yet. But let me ask a follow-up question to you, Diego. So it sounds like while there are regulations and standards, international re regulations and, and standards, it, 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 there's still no international treaty that deals with, with, with those uh, regulations and standards. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. It depends on every country, you know, if, if, I, I don't know the regulations of other countries now, but um, it's about that country assuming or making mandatory that, that for example, if you want to import um, laptops into Argentina, you have to comply with ISO, whatever. And that product has also to comply with certain other regulations. It's more about that, that making it mandatory for any manufacturer, any place in the world to manufacture, to take that out of the factory with certain standards. Uh, and so still we see, um, you know, that that's because of some of the cases we have been working with. You see some, 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 some products that are, for example, Bluetooth, um, uh, they have features for Bluetooth and, and the product itself is so poorly manufactured that when you talk to the forensics guy, they say, it was impossible not to gain access into this product because this and that. 
And, and the same goes for, you know, and this will resemble to any of us. You, many, many products come from factory settings like admin, admin for username and password. And so something that is very, very easy to change is uh, bring some other, you know, do not start working for the product unless you re register online and you change your password into a more protected password and things like that. I think there's a lot of uh, room for construing there. Okay. Uh, Melanie, what's what's your take on international standards and uh, uh, the, you know the, the the mandatory nature or not of, of them? I mean, I think that that would be an amazing thing. I mean, even in the United States, we can't seem to have a single data breach notification law. We have 50 different laws. Um, there isn't even agreement on what constitutes a data breach. Some states here say you know a breach is based on. Um, whether data has been accessed. Other states say a breach has only occurred if data has been acquired, um, which is a pretty significant difference. Um, even the information that constitutes protected personal identifiable information varies from state to state. Um, I think there certainly is a push here to have more federal legislation and certainly global, I think is, you know, I think Diego's point spot on. Like if we're really looking to um, protect you know, individuals and consumers and companies from threat actors, it has to, we have to be united in it. And I think there are basic easy ways for that to be achieved. I think Diego is also right, you know, when devices come with factory settings that say admin, admin, you know, in order to use the device, you know, it shouldn't take a lot um, for the manufacturers to require, um, you know, the user to actually, you know, create a username and a password and they can't stick with the factory settings. I mean, just basic things like that it doesn't have to be revolutionary, but it will require, um, you know, a concerted effort amongst various countries and, and nations to come together to sort of force the hand. Um, but I, I, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with them um, that it would be um, a great thing. And it's probably the only path really to starting to taper down into to limit um, threat actors. Okay, thank you. Now let, let's switch to, I mean, I, I would like to hear more about, I mean, it, it seems like the regulations in each country, from what I heard, there, there's, uh, the, the, there's, there's the need to notify the government of, of a security incident of a of data breach or, or a data breach. So first of all, confirm, and this goes to everyone, uh, and please confirm if that uh, notice is mandatory and tell, or not, and tell us a bit about the process that companies have to follow after that. Uh, what, why don't you keep, keep telling us about that, Melanie? Sure, so in the United States, it actually depends um, on the industry that the company is in and most data breach notification laws, it's about the data. So um, it really depends on, you know, if you have a data breach um, and let's say it's a ransomware event and data was merely encrypted, it's not like the more prevalent version where it's exfiltrated. It depends whether you're in an access or an exfiltration state. So if you're in a state that defines a data breach based on mere access alone, um, and there is a chance that you might have to notify if you're in a state where it's based on the acquirement of information. And all that ha happened was that, you know, malware downloaded and encrypted files, then the company wouldn't have to notify. And to constitute a breach, it has to be of, at least within the United States, personal identifiable information. Certain states also say that you only need to notify us if, you know, one person of our state's resident has been compromised other states say, no, don't, you don't need to tell us at least 500, you know, of our um, state's residents have been impacted or some states say even a thousand people um, because they don't want to have, you know, so many notices. So it really varies um, dependent upon, you know, what that state constitutes as a data breach, the number of individuals that are impacted and how that state happens to define, um, you know, personal identifiable information. And the only difference here is there are federal statutes in addition that protect, you know, medical information. So you have HIPAA, um, which can come into play, but even HIPAA, while well, you have to notify the Office of Civil Rights, even if one person's been impacted, you have um, within 60 days of the next year to give notice to the agency, um, you know, um, but you don't have to give notice to, um, you know, 
publicly unless 250 people have been impacted. If 250 um, people have been impacted, I believe you have to give notice to the media about the event. Um, we have GDPR, which um, regulates financial institutions. Um, there's also um, FISMA, which impacts and requires um, notices under for um, government agencies. So there isn't like a, a federal law that um, you have to deal with that globally um, says one thing for all different types of companies, but there are industry specific regulations in addition to the statutory state regulations that you have to deal with here. Got it. So yeah, it, it's it's way more complex than uh, my, my, my question initially uh, appeared to refer to, but, and it sounds like the process after, which was the second part of my question, the process after you, if, if you indeed need to file a notice, right, for any government body, uh, w w in general, and I know it depends where it could, it could change depending where you're actually filing that yeah. notice. In general, is there, is there are, are there several steps that need to happen after that that the company has to follow or just notify and that's the end of it? So it depends on the state. Most states that require notices will be to the attorney general's office. Some states will say to the attorney general's office and to um, the consumer protection office and or also to their um, police force office. They tend to be online forms. Um, and then it's really a wait and see game. Some states um, historically will come back and ask for additional information, even if it's just one resident. Other states, historically, even if it's 20,000 of the residents won't ask for additional, additional information because um, the, you know, they have bigger fish to fry, frankly, that there are bigger events that happen um, and they have a limited resources so they can only investigate and get additional information on matters that impact maybe 50,000 or 100,000 people or more. Okay, got it. And, and, and is there additional obligation for the companies to uh, uh, you know, inform the government agent, the relevant government agency about the resolution of the breach or the outcome or you know, any other information that they would, they would need to, to obtain in order to kind of finalize that case, if you will? Only if the AG's office or the Consumer Protection Office asks for additional, additional information, they usually will ask also for, um, you know, the resolution, all of the steps that you took, they'll want to know what forensic vendor you used, the forensic investigation, you know, they'll want to know what, um, you know, prior to the event, what security measures you had placed, they'll want copies of your data breach um, plans, your breach response plans and like infrastructure plans. They'll want to know how much penetration testing you've been doing. Is it annual? They'll want to know about education of your employees. How often do you do phishing testing? And they get pretty deep into it. Um, but it really vacillates from state to state and from regulator to regulator. Um, notoriously, I would say OCR um, because medical information um, via HIPAA and then high tech, which was passed in 2009, was sort of first within the United States that was so heavily regulated, tend to be the strongest um, in pursuing that. But I think that, you know, other agencies are starting to, within the last few years, also really, you know, get their hands around it and start to pursue and ask for additional information. Got it. Thank you. Paulo, what, what, what can you tell us about Brazil? Are, are those notices mandatory and what's the process? Yeah, uh, yes, for, for data breach, uh, the, the general data protection law, which is very similar to GDPR, uh, sets out that a data breach must be notified within a reasonable period of, of time whenever it entails material risks or damages to data subject. So first, the, the concept of data breach under the LGPD, under the Brazilian Data Protection Law, is very broad. So any unauthorized access or any accidental or un unlawful situations of destruction, loss, alteration, communication, or any type of improper or unlawful processing. For, but uh, therefore, any uh, security, any data breach that compromise confidentiality, integrity, and avail uh, availability as long as it uh, uh, poses material risks or damages to uh, individuals, to data subjects, then it's a notifiable incident. Uh, the, the National Data Protection Authority is currently regulating the, the criteria to notify. Uh, so we, at this moment, we know that 
the number of, uh, of individuals affected is something that could be considered to be uh, uh, material. Uh, the categories of personal data, it's, uh, uh, whether there are sensitive personal data like uh, uh, sex orientation, health data, um, uh, uh, data that could may cause discrimination, the same as the special categories of data in, 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 the, uh, in Europe. Also, whether or not it involves uh, minors' data, like children's data, uh, or uh, teenagers. So, uh, whether or not the individual will be uh, uh, posed to, to risks. So, it's very uh, uh, broad uh, standard for notification. Uh, there are other regulations. Uh, the, the, as I mentioned before, the Brazilian Security Exchange Commission it requires a disclosure of the, the of the incident when it compromised business continuity, uh, and also have sectorial laws, sectorial regulations that also requires notification. For example, uh, uh, insurance companies must notify this the insurance regulator. Uh, in case of an incident that uh, may uh, jeopardize the sector. So there are uh, different uh, regulations dealing with that, but the most comprehensive uh, 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 law that uh, requires notification is the, the, the general data protection law. So it's very comprehensive uh, a set of rules in that regard, but it's something that's currently being uh, regulated. Okay, thank you, Paulo. Uh, Vitello, what about what about Mexico in terms of uh, notification requirements and its process? Well, in at least in Mexico, it's also in the case of data protection and the Exchange Commission uh, here in Mexico. For the case of data protection, we have uh, uh, important difference that I have already mentioned. For the private sector, there is no obligation to notificate the agency responsible of the protection of personal data, but just uh, but just to the subject of data. So. In this case, uh, what actually or usually happens is that the users get notified and they and, and the rule uh, that is on the law also says that um, uh, it should extend or should be uh, it should affect the assets or the goods of, of, of the people that is affected and they should be notified and that they should provide uh, any means uh, of information or uh, countermeasures to uh, uh, reduce the risk of having these uh, affectations happening. The second part is uh, for the public sector is pretty much as a GDPR, very similar like in Brazil. They have a 48 hour, uh, a 48 hour uh, time slot to notify the authority. And obviously, uh, they have to tell us uh, a minimum of the extent of the, the extent of the data breach, how many how many records they have been compromised, uh, what kind of data have been compromised, and uh, what they have been doing to uh, stop uh, this uh, data breach uh, for in the first very for eight hours. What usually follows in the case of the public sector is a, a verification process that uh, it may vary from time to time, but it's commonly 90 days. And in 90 days, what commonly happens is that we start with a, a sanctionatory procedure uh, with what we have acquired from this data breach. In the case of private sector, when we know of the data breach, we have two means of knowing that the users that have been subject to a data breach uh, uh, file a claim in email or that we have uh, a monitoring uh, system of data breaches so that the NICE comes to know by his means of National Guard means that there has been a breach. So we start uh, an, uh, a procedure uh, by uh, just by this means of what we have to learn. And uh, usually in uh, 180 days or 90 days, we start with a sanctionatory procedure that uh, the fines can come uh, depending on the income of the company, but uh, from uh, a few thousand pesos to several million pesos. I think that the record is uh, 500 million pesos, something like that. 
but this uh, time is still being disputed on, on the court. So let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's pretty much uh, what actually happens. And obviously uh, the trade, the public trade companies, they are obliged to discuss, uh, to disclose to their, uh, to their shareholders that they have been uh, having a compromise and that's pretty much it. Nothing else happens at least if they want to pursue a felony on this crime, they have to file it uh, with the, um, the general attorney's office here in Mexico. Okay, and, and are the uh, mandatory notice notifications uh, that need to need to go to the government, are those rooted through your office, through the, through the INAI? In the case of the public sector, yes, are rooted through us. In the case of the private sector, there's it's not mandatory for the agency. And in the case of the trade uh, exchanges, it goes uh, to the uh, Bolsa de Valores and then to the uh, Secretaria of Hacienda, that it should be the Treasury Office or the equivalent mm -hmm. uh, here on the States. And uh, they actually have some uh, administrative procedures in the case that the also the shareholder was a bank or uh, an institutional uh, a finance institution but a part of that everything goes for in i understood thank you vitelio diego what can you tell us about uh, argentina so um, argentina is a little more complicated uh, as, <laughs> as i mentioned before we have, um, we have a law that was enacted 20 years ago. And so, of course, we, we were not envisioning uh, so many cyber attacks and security incidents. So what we have is we have a general rule that you have to take appropriate measures uh, to protect data, to protect the confidentiality and security of the data. But you have nothing about either notifying the regulator or the data subject. Um, in a couple of years ago, there was some um, recommended security measures, which among the recommendations is to notify the data protect protection authority in the case of um, a, a security incident encompassing personal data, of course. Um, but again, it's, it's uh, something recommended. I would say that it's not, uh, it's not yet something very clear in Argentina. We don't see a practice of companies reporting a lot of security incidents. On the other side, you have the Civil and Commercial Code, um, which actually talks about prevention of damage. And so it's a balance in between what data, for example, if it's a personal um, a data breach with personal data, you have to make your own balance as to whether the information that was leaked could affect um, data subjects in some material way. And, and maybe that would get to a conclusion that you should notify at least data subjects. And for example, ask them to change their password if it's about passwords or, you know, uh, tell them that their uh, credit card data has been compromised. Um, on top of that, as uh, Paolo was saying before, we do have sectorial sectoral regulations, like for example, the, I would say the, the most important being the, the financial institutions regulations from the central bank that talks about notifications. It's not just about personal data, but also about any security incident that could have the effect of uh, making financial services unavailable. And so you have a, a requirement there that's something that um, banks and other financial institutions normally follow. It's more complicated when it comes to fintechs and you try to see whether they are uh, regulated or not within those same regulations. Um, and the other thing that I see, Diego, that I think it's something that, that uh, it's maybe applicable to all of us, it's about their own contracts that the company has in place and maybe privacy policy in terms of use. Maybe the company has undertaken to notify, even if it's not mandatory. You might have said in your privacy policy that if you have a, private, um, a security incident, you will let them know. And that's something that you have to, of course, do. And the same with contracts. We have seen many, many, many cases in some of our clients that they have um, several very important contracts with their clients, which stated that they would notify within a certain time frame any security incident. So it's it's not only sometimes it's not only digging into the regulations, but also very important to look into what the company has um, voluntarily undertaken. Um, and many in many cases there is a clue there, and and you have a a very important obligation to notify that that, uh, that breach. Okay. 
Now, let, let me ask you all again, um, is it legal for companies to pay ransoms? Uh, why don't we start with you, Melanie? Um, it can be. It just it depends on a few different things. So I think, as I mentioned earlier, an OFAC um, just passed or not passed, but on September 21st, so it was last week, came out um, with an amended sort of advisory on how to handle ransoms. Um, they can be legal. Um, OFAC has determined that if you are in the special designated um, national list, though certain groups cannot be paid because um, they've been earmarked as you know, criminals and or you know, certain um, virtual um, currency exchanges can't be used. Um, but by and large, you know, it, as long as you pass an OFAC, they call it you know, routinely an OFAC check, a ransom payment can be made a part of the advisory that came out last week was very explicit though that they strongly encourage that the FBI or the Secret Service immediately be notified when a company has um, suffered a ransomware attack um, so that they have been put on notice and that you are cooperative um, as a mitigating factor to ensure that um, you know in general while ransomware matters are highly discouraged um, if you are compliant with the government, notifying them and working with them throughout the process, um, you've performed your OFAC check, you know, hopefully you won't be sanctioned. Um, the sanctions have been determined to be mostly non-public, so there isn't a whole lot of visibility in terms of what they look like as of right now. Um, but the, you know, with President Biden, the um, federal government is coming pretty strong and trying to limit and to discourage people from paying ransoms, but there's not presently a law that prohibits it as long as the threat actor is not on the designated um, national uh, list. Interesting. So, so if, if a company immediately not notifies the FBI, uh, I think you said also Secret Service, are they taking over kind of like the negotiation or what, what are they doing? They're not taking over the negotiations, but they do have provide information to the you know firm or the company um, if they are able. So ransomware, for those that don't know, there's a million, like not a million, but there are handfuls of different variants, right? And so certain variants are attached to specific or known to be a part of certain threat actor groups. And um, there are playbooks out there that if it is you know variant X then this is sort of the modus of operandi. This is how that threat actor group works. They likely came through VPN. They probably hit this first. They, you know, make sure that you've like, you know, disconnected your backups and they'll kind of guide you through how to protect your network to the best that you can after the fact. And also sort of give you information about um, um, not just like how the, the threat actor came in, like historically has come into networks, but how they respond to um, you know, negotiations and discussions. Interesting. But they don't actually do that, that work for you. You would normally retain an outside forensic IT vendor to have that communication because again, they are strongly discouraging any payment. So they don't want to have that conversation. And so I think part of the way they're trying to avoid or discourage people by having that conversation is to give you intel about that threat actor group so that you can learn things um, about what happened to you without having to directly contact that threat actor group. Interesting. And so, yeah, it's very interesting. The fact that there's no law prohibiting uh, payment of ransom, but what you mentioned about, you know, actors being flagged or listed by OFAC, I mean, that automatically makes it, would make it, make it unlawful to transact with them. Correct. Is that, is that what you were saying? Yes. So they have um, a list and yes. So you have to make sure it makes it illegal for anybody to make a payment. So not just it's not just illegal for that, um, that company to you know, hire another company to do the transaction. The company doing the transaction, it's unlawful for them to actually do the transaction. So when you, um, if you fall prey to um, a ransomware matter and you have to hire a forensic IT firm and somebody who will do the negotiations for you, it's in their best interest also, and they will do an OFAC check because it would be illegal for them to even do the transaction, even if it's at your order or your request. It, it follows the train of and the, down the line from everybody that's given approval on it. 
So, so what have you been seeing in terms of, you know, these companies, uh, you know, they identify that they're, in, in fact, the, you know, the, 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 the bad guys are lit, blacklisted by OFAC. Uh, so they just immediately, like, don't, don't stop negotiating or they just go, go ahead anyway. I actually haven't had a matter that has been on the OFAC list yet. So the OFAC list is, um, it, it's not a new thing, but it, it started, it, it was new as of like a few years ago, but they haven't designated specific variants yet. Um, like I mentioned, they've, you know, focused on the medium or um, the, the platform in which payments are being made presently. So, you know, a threat actor group can just move to a different virtual platform for them to receive their Bitcoin or whatever um, currency they're requesting. Um, so I haven't had one flagged yet in that situation, um, but I suspect that these threat actor groups change and move, right? And they come up with new variants. So I think they're usually a step ahead, <laughs> you know, to the best of their ability. Right, okay. Um, Paulo, what, what's, what's, what's the state of things in, in Brazil in, this, in connection with this? Uh, it's not illegal at all to pay uh, the ransom. It's like uh, seen as paying kidnappers response to extortion to release the victim. So it's the same. There's no restriction at all. We never know when companies pay. There are always rumors in these big cases, like the Loja Skinner that I mentioned before. Uh, they paid $20 million to restore the system, but we never know. It's always rumors. We, 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 uh, um, the fact that there's no uh, any prohibition in law to to pay the ransom, and, and indeed some companies often have been retaining IT vendors to 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 handle the negotiations properly, sometimes to gain time and not to pay to actually pay the ransom, but to gain time to get more evidence that data was distorted because there are always doubt. So uh, often the attacker have access. We know that the, the attacker had access to, to, to database, but we never know the amount of data that had been extorted, so uh, extracted. So uh, uh, negotiating sometimes is useful, but not necessarily paying, but it's not illegal at all. Okay. Vitelio, uh, what about Mexico? It's also not illegal. Uh, we haven't seen so many uh, so many cases that we actually know that the ransom has been paid. We know for a fact that some uh, big companies or uh, transnational companies they actually are starting to hire uh, insurances. Uh, just uh, in the case that they get some uh, cyber attack, they should be able to pay. Uh, pretty much like in the states, but it's not the common rule. And uh, as uh, Paulo says, it's something that you actually don't know it's, it's so like say so or hear from my cousin or whatever no, no people actually discloses it but we know for a fact that it's happening and we know that some companies are actually hiring insurances in this regard okay diego argentina anything different from that no last child last time i checked with our criminal attorneys it, it was still it was still legal to pay there are some concerns. I think that what Melanie was saying uh, about you know putting some barriers into what you can do as a company. I can remember here in Argentina some ten years ago, um, if if you have a family member being ransomed, um, uh, there was uh, if if you notify the police, there was an immediate freeze of all of your assets, which would not give you the ability to take any money from the bank account. Um, and so I don't know if you are in that position. I don't know if it's good or not when 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 some of your relatives are the lives of them are in the line. Uh, but with companies, it might be the same. I don't know if it would, you know, what what role would it play if you cannot actually get to the one million dollar that you have in the bank account? How how would that play with the criminals? Would they uh, stop with ransomware or would they just, you know, spread the data all over the deep web? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah good, good, good questions. So now um, we have 10 more minutes and I would like to switch to the last uh, segment of, 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 of the, of the uh, session, which deals with prevention and response to attacks. 
uh, both from private and, and public sector. So what, why don't we uh, uh, you know, go, go into that? And, and, and the next question is towards, uh, directed towards Diego, Paulo, and Melanie, who are in the private sector. What, what are companies doing to prevent and respond to, to attacks against them? And then I'll, I'll turn it to you, Vitelio, so you can tell us about what, what the government is doing. Uh, what, why don't you get started? The, uh, sorry, Melanie. Sure. So I think to prevent their hiring specialized forensic IT firms, um, not just to you know build the their network um, infrastructure, but also to start doing penetration testing um, and to test the security that they have um, to find holes, to find if you know some you know it only takes one laptop that wasn't patched. You know it only takes one you know, one of the, you know, 250 endpoints on their network to be out of date. And so, um, which can be difficult to find. Um, so companies are now hiring um, IT firms to do penetration testing and basically see if they can break into their, to their company and then tell them, you know, where that hole was found so that they can harden their network. Um, in terms of responding to incidents, they are hiring also specialized legal counsel, you know, a specialized forensic IT firm to determine, you know, how it happened, the breadth of the incident was their lateral movement throughout their network, was any data exfiltrated. Um, and I'd say, honestly, in light of these expenses, they're also getting like special cyber um, insurance um, to cover and defray these costs and these risks, because it's incredibly expensive to have to you know, hire special counsel, hire a forensic IT firm, that doesn't even account for the restoration fees that you may have, that doesn't count for their business interruption, or in terms of notification, mailing, call center, credit monitoring, notices to regulators, the defense to the notice of regulators, any lawsuits that may ensue. Um, you know, these are, it's just becoming, I think, a whole new world and a new environment that you know, I think companies are having to do multiple things to prevent and then also um, after the fact and, and how to deal with it. Paolo, what do you what do you what do you think about that? Well, uh, definitely the companies are not doing enough. Uh, I don't see uh, companies uh, you know, putting money in prevent cyber uh, security prevention. But what I've been seeing is that the companies that are doing the homework are uh, doing it's very similar to what Manny just said, like penetration testing, uh, uh, investing in training. And that training is very important. Simulation of uh, data breaches. I've been seeing also some clients doing like a phishing, a mock phishing attack like launching like a simulation of uh, uh, malware uh, through email and to see whether the, the professionals, uh, employees are uh, clicks, whether or not they click in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the clickbait, in the, in the malware. We have been seeing uh, uh, an increase in, insur in cyber insurance something that it was a kind of insurance that was not very popular in Brazil a few uh, since uh, two years ago. Now it's getting more popular. Uh, uh, companies are, we are also uh, urging companies to retain the forensics and also the external counsel to in advance uh, as a prevention. So when uh, the, 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 the data breach happens, we already have providers engaged to, to start uh, managing the crisis. So it's very important because uh, the first 24 hours is crucial. So once you have uh, these providers already engaged, is, everything is, is easier uh, to deal with the, the, the incident. And also having an instant uh, response plan in place with the training, with the simulations, with the the the, the tests, in order to to make sure that when the real thing happens, you are prepared. Diego, I, I've seen I've seen this, a, a little bit of everything that Melanie and, and Paolo were saying. Uh, there, there's there there are more people are more aware of of the threats 
I would say that two or three years ago. So companies are hiring IT vendors that are better than they're doing some uh, risk assessments. They are um, getting their cyber insurance policies, which are not very frequent yet in the in the in the in the market. And what I'm seeing, yes, a lot different from from uh, previous years, is trainings. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of training for the for the company employees. Uh, I guess that there are still many, many, many cyber incidents coming from from employees. You know, clicking on things that they shouldn't have, or even you know, being better as, as to give them permissions as to who has to access what. Uh, I, I I can remember Diego a very a very funny conversation with a CEO of a company. Uh, he was claiming that because he was the CEO, he need to have access to every file in the company. And so the IT guys were saying, we are trying to protect you. If you have access yep. to everything, you are a liability for the company. You do not need to have access. Someone will have access and give you whatever you access you need at the time you need it. But that's a very difficult conversation in, in places like, like our countries. But that, that's, you know, that can show you how, how we think and, and how we have to change our minds in, in this specific respect uh, as to minimize who has access to what um, if it's not necessary for that person to have access to vital uh, information of the company. Okay. Now, Vitalia, what, what is what is the Mexican government doing? Uh, what can you tell us about in terms of uh, 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 preventing and responding to these attacks? Well, uh, for instance, we have the national strategy on cybersecurity that is a coordinated between agencies uh, strategy designed to respond. This has been or is still implemented uh, by a fact. I know that we are working on a refreshed uh, manual of MATIC that are the security and cybersecurity guidelines for infrastructure in government. And also the National Guard has been issued a guidance and um, certification on the implementation of MATIC and some basic cybersecurity issues that should be addressed by every IT um, engineer that is commissioned in any Mexican institution. So that's from that part. Uh, we think that we have to do a lot more and by, uh, we're still starting to retain uh, some of the uh, government agencies are retaining uh, private companies uh, just as cybersecurity consultants. So that's an interesting part. We still haven't seen uh, results on that, but we will be seeing them, I think, uh, maybe by mid uh, next year and see if, if this uh, new matic uh, helps to reduce the rate of uh, cyber uh, security breaches in or security breaches in, in government agencies. Do you know, has, has it been uh, made public any, any uh, you know, known uh, security breach for, to the Mexican government. Yes. Um, I, I, yeah, could, could you tell us about that? I mean, only if it's public, of course. Yes, we have uh, at least, uh, for what we know, we have uh, three of them. Uh, one doesn't have to do actually with cybersecurity, but human fault. But uh, what we actually got is a Pemex. It was a ransomware attack. We don't know for a fact is they if they paid the ransom no because they allegedly were able to restore pretty much everything up to one week uh, before uh, the attack actually happened. But we know right now that they have been on their servers like for three or four months uh, uh, before the uh, before the attack. So uh, it's interesting what's going to happen there. Then they they were stolen or some part of Pemex that is the national oil, oil company was installed like, I don't know, a couple of weeks at least. And from the data protection point of view, we are we have a procedure in process. So uh, I'm not allowed to speak yet from it, yeah, but yeah. You know, it happened. <laughs> no, and no, but th thanks for sharing, Vitalia. That's, 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 I don't want to put pressure on you to, to disclose that, but that, that, was, that was interesting enough. And now I am receiving a note from Michael that we have to start saying goodbye. And I, I want to personally thank everyone here. It, this has been tremendously useful and informative and Michael and the New York City Bar Association uh, for putting this together. Um, I guess uh, this is this is goodbye. Thanks so much for, for everyone attending. Thank you.